Coming up, the borders are closed. It's terrible. And the jungles are dense. A hell in the jungle. But nothing is stopping these refugees from trying to get a better life. A better future for our family, our kids. Plus, a boxer who was knocked down and out. I blacked out at that point. And the clock was ticking. I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't think. Here what got him back in the ring. All of a sudden, I felt peace. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. Let's go up to 30,000 feet and look down at the nation that we love so much and see what's going on. I think if you take that perspective, you begin to see what's happening. There was an election where a man named Mitt Romney was the nominee of the Republican Party. He was one of the most honorable men. He was a straight hour if you ever had one. He was married to his lovely wife. They had wonderful children. I mean, he was, he was a picture perfect man uh, in public office. And he was ex very successful, Bain Capital and so forth. Well, starting in the spring, the barrage began against him. He was a plutocrat. He didn't understand women. He was brutal to his employees. Uh, he lived a life way beyond anything else. He didn't understand the common man. And on and on it went. The attack ads were fast and furious. So coming in to the summer and the general election, he's already weakened because of this barrage of, acts, of, of uh, ads against him. And then they open up with everything else. And they had a dog. They had a dog and a dog carry on top of a car. And the dog may have gotten, a, I don't know, a cold or something. And so he's a dog hater. I mean, it was just unbelievable what they did. And before it was over with, of course, he lost uh, uh, handily in the election. So the same attack um, machine has been going against Donald Trump. It is unbelievable. I mean, th this stuff is, of course, a lot of it's uh, self-inflicted, I know. But nevertheless, uh, it, it is dirty and it's nasty. And will the Republicans ever be able to put somebody out who holds to conservative values without being trashed and eviscerated? It is, it is a, the politics of self-destruction. And the Democrats are playing it to a T. That's the way it works. Doesn't matter how many people they've got that have uh, sexual peccadilloes of major proportions, how many have been indicted for lying and so forth. It doesn't matter how many have done that. It's a question of 11 years ago, uh, there was a overheard conversation put on tape. And that's enough to disqualify a man from, from office. It's, it's unbelievable. So. Are we going to get suckered by it? I think the Republicans are. They're running for the hills. They, they can't stand and fight. The Democrats, if they've got a man with moral flaws, it doesn't matter. They're going to stand around their man. And, and uh, Bill Clinton, they coalesced around Clinton. They weren't going to let him get impeached. The House impeached him, but the Senate wouldn't vote it. He comes out, and the next thing you know, uh, he and his wife have accumulated a fortune of maybe $200 million and a, a, a foundation that has a couple of billion. Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, and he's, he's pulling down huge fees. Will uh, Hillary's getting huge fees. But this is the kind of life that we're living in America. And if we want to be a leftist socialist nation, this is the way we're going. If we want the Supreme Court to take away the gun rights, then they will. If you want the Supreme Court to take away uh, religious liberty, they will. If you want to open up the, the doors to all kinds of uh, uh, bizarre lifestyles, that's going to happen. And <clears throat> if you believe differently than that, your voice will be still, and there will probably be a, a renewal of the fairness doctrine in, in terms of uh, uh, broadcast. It's all coming. So the question is, uh, 11 years ago, I overheard conversation. Are we going to pull the chain on the man that's the Republican? and give this election to Nancy Pelosi and uh, uh, the, the Democrats. That's the choice. And the Republicans are saying, yes, I think we'll do that, because we don't want to be associated with uh, something that may uh, uh, have a moral taint to it. Uh, it it's crazy. But uh, I, I worry about a nation that's, that's letting that happen. 
because it happens not, not up ballot, all the way down the ballot. It's the politics of self-destruction. And, and uh, it, it, it makes me sick. It used to be that men who ran against one another were gentlemen. Uh, they brought forth issues. The issues were put on the table. The electorate would decide which of those issues, which of those policies they wanted, and that's what they voted for. No more. And it starts, and you can see it in race after race after race. That's the game. And if we're dumb enough to get played by it, and that looks like what's happening, then we'll take the consequences. And so this may be the nastiest presidential race ever. Uh, we've got only a, a month left to go, but unfortunately, with this politics of self-destruction and, and destruction, it could get nastier. And uh, both candidates attacking each other on the campaign trail. And both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are dealing with leaks. Trump's videotape from more than a decade ago, and Clinton with a new WikiLeaks release about her campaign. Heather Sells has the story. The comments on the Trump tape forced the Republican National Committee chair to call committee members on Monday and reiterate his support for Trump. But Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, is cutting ties. He said Monday that he would no longer defend or campaign for Trump, although he didn't withdraw his endorsement. One well-known theologian, Wayne Grudem, pulled his support from Trump, but evangelical leaders Ralph Reed and Jerry Falwell Jr. are still backing him. Reed and Falwell refused to defend his remarks, but said that his position on critical issues like abortion and Supreme Court nominees still make him preferable to Hillary Clinton. On the campaign trail, Clinton is taking full advantage of the fallout. But you know, it wasn't just this one video that was so disturbing, even shocking. We have seen this kind of behavior throughout this entire campaign. Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, is speaking in Trump's defense. It takes a big man to know when he's wrong and to admit it and to have the humility to apologize and be transparent and be vulnerable with people. Trump, meanwhile, says he'll continue to attack Clinton if any more recordings are released. If they want to release more tapes saying inappropriate things, we'll continue to talk about Bill and Hillary Clinton doing inappropriate things. There are so many of them. Clinton is also working to downplay a new WikiLeaks email release. The 70-page document shows a hits file against Bernie Sanders from last fall, questioning his progressive bona fides. The Clinton campaign is blaming the release on Russian President Vladimir Putin. The tape has apparently hurt Trump in the polls, but there haven't been any polls yet after his strawn showing in Sunday night's debate. And with one final debate left, both Trump and Clinton will be working to win over voters while focusing on the key battleground states that will decide the White House in the Electoral College. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, uh, it's, it's a sad state. This thing has been awful, just awful. This is the greatest nation on earth, and what have we got? But you know, I, I was reading, you know, Hillary Clinton, quote, potty mouth, and all the awful, awful stuff that she said behind the scenes in the White House. It's on book after book after book, these things. Filthy stuff. I mean, she's, oh, I'm shocked. Well, she's shocked when she, you know, says, uh, you know, denigrating remarks about people and, and fires people and, and uh, takes over the White House. Uh, uh, travel office to give it to her friends and goes on and on and on. There's so much stuff there. It's all dirty and it just makes you sick. I mean, we are the greatest nation on earth. How could we have fallen into this? Cannot we have high-minded, cannot we look for the highest ideals and, and try to elect the, the most noble people? Well, the answer is the most noble people don't want to get into this mess anymore because of what it gets done to them. They don't want to take the abuse. Well, the next president is going to have to face a serious international threat. North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Here's Ephraim. Pat, North Korea celebrated the 10th anniversary of its first nuclear bomb test on Sunday. And as Dale Heard reports, experts warn the danger from the communist north is growing. Repeated international efforts to stop North Korea's nuclear program have failed. 
And now it seems all South Korea and its U.S. ally have left is deterrence, including a preemptive strike or the threat of nuclear retaliation. Uh, South Korea's defense minister says we have clarified several times that if North Korea shows imminent signs of using nuclear weapons, we can launch a self-defensive preemptive nuclear strike. American UN envoy Samantha Power was in South Korea for the anniversary and said the U.S. would use every tool it had, including the military, to deter North Korea. Satellite surveillance of North Korea indicates it is preparing for another nuclear test. It's not only clear that U.S. efforts to stop North Korea's nuclear program have failed, but that the communist nation intends to become a major nuclear threat. A new report from the RAND Corporation says coupled with its missile program, North Korea could have up to 100 missile-launched nuclear weapons within just four years. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Pat, what do we do? Well, that's the $64,000 question, what do we do? What we should have done a long time ago was to follow General MacArthur's advice to go all the way to the Yellow River and seal off North Korea uh, and, and really destroy that uh, fledgling uh, dictatorship before it got underway. That's what we should have done. Instead of that, the politicians in, in Washington said, no, no, we, we can't have a confrontation with China. We've got to back off, and uh, we're going to fire MacArthur, and we'll uh, settle at the uh, uh, 38th parallel, and we'll you know, go into endless negotiations. Then the next thing we started to do, Bill Clinton had an initiative. We're going, to, we're going to make friends with those nice people in North Korea, and we're going to give them all kinds of food. We're going to give them all kinds of aid. And because of this aid, they're going to stop this nuclear program. Nonsense. The North Koreans took the food, took the aid, and laughed at us and kept on building. They have a tiny economy. They're desperately poor. But they're spending at least probably 30 to 40 percent of the whole gross national, national product on weapons and arms. And they have a very robust nuclear program. Now, they've launched um, missiles out into the uh, China Sea and the Sea of Japan. And they're saying, OK, we can threaten uh, North, South, South Korea. We can threaten Japan. We're showing you can do that. But we're also building missiles that will reach the United States. And Kim Jong-un is saying, well, that's what I have in mind. Uh, now, what will we do? We'll let this thing continue to simmer. And then the time will come that they will say, OK, you leave the Korean Peninsula, or we're going to decimate San Francisco. And we say, no, we can't let that happen. Well, it's going to happen unless we do something to stop it. And does that mean we go in there and bomb those facilities? We may have to do that. We may have to take a preemptive strike. But uh, as Congressman King said, this is a, uh, a crime family with a nation. And that's what it amounts to. It's a crime family with a nation. And uh, they're dangerous, terribly dangerous. And not only that, they're exporting their nuclear technology to places like Iran. They're working together. And so we're going to be faced with nuclear-empowered nations that hate us. And uh, our foreign policy has been feckless. We have not been resolute and strong. And we're viewed as weak, and weak in fights, trouble. So there we are. And uh, now we've got an election where we're worried about 11-year-old uh, uh, videotape of obscene comments instead of worrying about what do we do with North Korea, what do we do with South Korea, what do we do with uh, the Taliban, what do we do with uh, Iran? Ephraim. Pat, families are still being evacuated after Hurricane Matthew tore through the Carolinas and Georgia, leaving several people dead and many homeless. The danger is still ongoing. 1,500 people had to be rescued Monday in North Carolina when a dam suddenly broke. Governor Pat McCrory explained the situation. We do have people on the roofs as we speak, and we have a lot of helicopters and boats uh, that have been deployed that are at this point in time rescuing them. Operation Blessing is also there helping people in Fayetteville, North Carolina. They're working alongside Governor McCrory and pastors in the community. Operation Blessing is here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We've been coordinating with local emergency management and pastors, and we spent the evening going door to door, checking on families, loving on them, and letting them know that volunteers will be here to help them starting tomorrow morning. 
Operation Blessing will be helping flood victims throughout North Carolina, and they're in need of volunteers. So if you would like to help them, simply go to Operation Blessing's website, ob.org. Pat. Well, you know, in, in our community uh, here in, in Tidewater, the flood's still there, you know, and people of certain areas are impassable. Uh, roads have been washed out, uh, big uh, uh, flooding still taking place, and the flood is unbelievable because uh, we're in a, in a sea uh, environment where when, when the tides come in and they, they go into these streams and the streams are swollen and, you know, it's, it's really a, a mess. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, uh, has hurt Haiti so badly. I said yesterday, I think 500 people, they said, you know, it's over 1,000. And it may be much more than that. The suffering is great. Now, Operation Blessing is helping people. Uh, <clears throat> the number is uh, 800 and 707,000. And that's Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. And uh, just like Fayetteville, North Carolina, wherever it is, wherever there, the people are hurting, we want to be there for them because we care and God cares. And we want to be His hand extended to help people. So if you want to be participating in that in any small amount or big amount, whatever, the number's there to call. Well, Ephraim, let's go ahead. Pat, this is National School Lunch Week. If your memories of the school cafeteria bring to mind things like mystery meat, well, you haven't been to the cafeteria lately. As Lori Johnson shows us, today's school's lunches are a lot like what you get in America's most popular restaurants, only a lot cheaper. They'll never be as good as mom's home cooking, but today's school lunches are earning straight A's. Well, my favorite kind of foods that I've ever gotten is their spaghetti. It's really good. I like the, the, their chicken nuggets and the pizzas. They haven't always scored such high marks. A couple years ago, schools nationwide started getting serious about nutrition and began offering much healthier choices, like this fresh chicken salad. The problem was kids didn't always choose what was best for them. New federal nutrition standards for school meals emphasize whole grains, fewer calories, no trans fats, and more green vegetables. In fact, kids are required to choose fruits and vegetables, but when those items were discovered in the trash, it was back to the drawing board. So we're looking for things that have good eye appeal, um, meat, of course, and nutritional components, but also our foods that students are familiar with. Uh, that's really important. Today, the kids are enjoying a Mexican fiesta similar to what they're used to eating at Chipotle. Other days, knockoffs from more of their favorite restaurants like Panera, all for just two fifty a meal. You know, we still have um, things like pizza or chicken nuggets on the menu, but um, it's not the same as it was even 10 years ago. Um, pizza will have a whole wheat crust and lower fat cheese and maybe turkey pepperoni instead of regular pepperoni. And chicken nuggets would be baked instead of fried. And again, they would have a whole grain um, breading instead of regular um, refined grains. Nationwide, nearly three-fourths of schools rely on student taste tests. About half offer gluten-free options. About two-thirds offer salad bars and two-thirds buy produce grown at nearby farms. For example, we'll be looking at local apples. Uh, you know, seasonality is really important to us. Kids still have the option of making less advisable choices, but they've learned the importance of eating right. Do you ever get like ice cream and things like that? I noticed you didn't get any dessert. Um, well, I usually get ice cream or some chips um, every like every week, like on a special occasion. If it's a special day, like my birthday or something, that's what I would get. I would get something like that. Hi guys, welcome to the Nutrition Express. This converted school bus is a mobile classroom. So, my hope is, so this is my plate. This is our healthy way of eating. This hands-on approach means the message tends to really sink in. What types of foods are healthy? I think of fruits and vegetables. And uh, like, that, have, that don't have too many calories or in low sugar. So when it comes to healthy school lunches, a three-pronged approach works best. Beefed up standards, better marketing, and teaching kids what it means to choose wisely.
Lori Johnson, CBN News. Got to start young, Pat. Hey, that's great. You know, our kids, we used to always have whole wheat sandwiches, and they was, we thought that was so nice. Well, they'd go to school and trade them off for white bread sandwiches with some other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sticks to the roof of your mouth. You it's not good. You think you're doing the right thing. <laughs> but, you know, when you're growing up, the taste buds get that way. I mean, if you, you know, have uh, uh, carrots and celery and, you know, for snacks and stuff like that, and you don't give them all kinds of sweets and sweet cereals and things like that. They, they get used to good food. And, and if you train them that way, when they get older, that's what they want when they get old. They want what they had with mama, because that was their, their comfort place. That's the place they liked it. So if you have nutritious food at home, before long, they'll learn that's the way to eat. But you, you, we're killing our kids. You can't just turn a five-year-old loose or a three-year-old and say, well, he's got to choose whatever he wants. No way. You decide what he's going to eat, and uh, he'll get used to it. The thing of it is, these little children have wonderful senses in their tongues. They have tremendous receptors for salt and for sweet and things like that. We don't as we get older. So what we do is jive these things up to make us feel good, whereas the kids, can, they could eat you know, plain oatmeal, and it would just taste delicious. We've got to put all kinds of sugar and stuff on it to make it taste good. But we don't have to do that for the little children, because God gave them the receptors to be sensitive to salt, to sugar, and these other things, without having to add a lot to it. Well, it's nice to see how positively things have changed in the school Thank the meals. Lord. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. the Lord. And, and, the, and the private teaching yeah. of that. Yeah, All I think is that's not important. lost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't speak the language, and they don't know where they are on a map. All they know is that they have a long trek ahead of them in search of a better life. CBN News takes you to the border of Panama for an exclusive look at the refugee crisis there. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Mr. You know, all over the world, we're, we're seeing a population explosion up to close to 7 billion people or more. And uh, the amount of food to take care of them is not available. The amount of money for relief is not available. Uh, the jobs are not available. And country after country is in pretty desperate condition with this huge overhang of debt all over the world. And so how do they take care of this burgeoning population? Well, they don't really. And a flood of humanity is surging, for example, through Latin America, where there's a very high birth rate. And it's heading for the U.S. of A. Our Chuck Holden recently reported on the thousands of Cuban migrants who are going through Panama. And as he tells us in this report, those Cubans are just the tip of the iceberg of a million refugees and counting have made their way into Europe over the last year and a half, garnering massive media coverage worldwide. But that same reporting may have served to ignite the idea of mass immigration in the minds of the masses all over the globe. Here in Panama, immigrants from over 20 countries are trekking through the vast and dangerous Darien jungle with little more than the clothes on their backs, all with one single-minded purpose, to make it to the United States, even if they have to walk. The tiny village of Metete is one of the first places these refugees are processed by Panamanian immigration authorities once they emerge from the jungle. The worst of their ordeal may be over, but they still have a long way to go. Samuel Adenyi is from Nigeria, where he was attending church one Sunday when the Islamic group Boko Haram attacked. They threw something into the church, and we some people ran away, quite some they got burnt. As I was running away, I got burnt through all my body. I spent all here, I was like a roasted chicken. Some friends found him and took him to the coast, where they put him aboard a cargo ship. The guy that put me in, inside the ship told me I have to hide myself, mm -hmm. just like in the engine. I didn't know where they were taking me to. It was when I arrived at uh, Columbia, mm -hmm. then I, the two, I didn't know where Columbia was. There, he found a large group of Africans planning to go to the U.S. Unable to speak Spanish, Samuel simply followed the crowd straight into the forbidding Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama. He had no idea what he was in for. It was very, very tough. It, 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 it was like a, a hell in the jungle because this is the first ever in my life I experienced such. I never had such experience. 
On May 9th, Panama's president officially closed its border with Costa Rica. But in reality, that's easier said than done. Commissioner Oriel Ortega has been given the monumental task of stopping the flood of migrants walking into Panama from Colombia. Approximately 7,000 to 7,500 have come through here so far this year. Over the last five years, we've had a massive exodus of migrants crossing our border with the intention of going to North America. The jungle is very dangerous. There are lots of difficult situations like sicknesses, wild animals, even criminals. These border police are doing their best to stop the flow of migrants, while at the same time caring for those who survived the trek. But they have a lot of ground to cover. There are approximately 276 kilometers of border between the Pacific and the Caribbean. We are maintaining constant patrols in addition to being in the communities inside the Darien. Despite the border being closed, hundreds of migrants continue to come through every day. My name is Sayed Imran Gilani, and I'm from Pakistan. Sayed traveled by air from Pakistan to Brazil and later continued north, hoping to make it to the United States. His trip has been equally arduous. It's terrible. The journey from uh, Brazil until here, it's terrible. In Colombia, mm -hmm. most of people get robbed by police. Yes. Yeah. They even said to me, the, the guy even told me to get naked. Wow. He took my pants off. He checked everywhere, you know, a person who can think and hide money. He checked, he knew exactly where to look. Do you have a passport? No, I don't. So you came with no passport yes. or did you lose it? I lose it. Syed and his friends' troubles are compounded by the fact that they hail from a Muslim country. But they say the violence is what they're running from. We are afraid to live there. We want a peaceful life. Mm -hmm. a better future for our family, our kids, you know? Yeah. Do you think we are terrorists? But we are not terrorists. Right. It's rumored that the U.S. Embassy in Panama is vetting refugees from Muslim countries who end up here. But the embassy refused repeated requests for comment. Nicaragua and Costa Rica have also closed their borders to immigrants, meaning that Panama must struggle to deal with the continued flow without simply sending them along to the north. So far, no solution has been found. And in the meantime, these migrants are hoping things will work out somehow. So tell me what you hope to find in the United States. A justice, peace and justice for everybody. Everybody's equal. From Panama, I'm Chuck Holden for CBN News. You know, God must look down on this earth and the suffering breaks his heart because God is a loving, compassionate God. And he sees these creatures made in his image, and he sees them struggling and suffering. Uh, this, this whole thing is building to a crescendo, and it's going to have to blow and break. And what I see is a massive, a massive financial collapse. I think it's on the cusp of one. I think the uh, debt at, at uh, $150 trillion worldwide or something in that neighborhood it's beyond belief. It cannot be paid off, and it's going to collapse. And then these people will be out of work. They won't have enough food. I mean, there'll be a humanitarian crisis. I talked to our reporter in the Middle East, Chris Mitchell. He said they're going to go into Mosul, and they'll attack Mosul. He said there'll be a million refugees, and it's going to be a cold, cold winter. And those refugees won't have any place to go. They won't have anybody to look after them. And it'll be freezing cold, and it'll be a humanitarian disaster. Well, it's going to be this all over the world. And it's tragic. And if there was ever a time to pray and say, God, help us, you have the Muslims trying to I mean, fight and kill, and uh, you've got ISIS and Boko Haram and all those French groups. You've got uh, chaos in the Philippines. You've got stuff going on in Indonesia. You've got uh, all around the world, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, all these hot spots. And it's like the devil himself is saying, I'm going to stir up trouble. I'm going to cause trouble. And what will we look for? What will, what will, what will we, as human beings, what will we look for? Will we look for some savior, some man of wisdom who will come and solve these problems? Because at this point, they're beyond the, the uh, scope of the normal democratic or, or governmental processes. And we looked at somebody and say, I have the answers. Well, we don't have him yet, but the Bible says he may be on the way. Terry? 
Well, up next, a boxer with malice in his heart and bleeding in his brain. Watch what happens when he gets floored and see what picked him back up. Well, you're watching the 700 Club. I want to introduce you to a guy whose name is Juan. And Juan and boxing were a perfect match. Juan's fists were deadly weapons. And his explosive temper found an outlet right inside the ring. But after taking one too many shots to the head, Juan went down. His brain was bleeding. And he wasn't going to be the same if he got back up. I had a assault with a deadly weapon charge, and it wasn't because I grabbed a gun or something. That was a fit of rage. Kid, poor kid, did nothing to me. Juan Mancias was 15 when he nearly killed another teenager with his bare hands. His anger began when he was a young boy, and in the most unlikely place, the church where his father and grandfather were pastors. So I felt like every single time I went to church, I was walking into a courtroom, and why would I want to go through that? Juan stopped going to church. The source of that anger was never feeling good enough for God. And if I'm not going to feel the love or if I'm going to be judged, then I'm going to act out. I took it out in fights. I took it out in just breaking stuff. After the assault charge, his father persuaded Juan, already a skilled baseball player, to take up boxing as a way to channel his anger. Every person that made me mad at school or a teacher, I took it out in the boxing gym. Juan's boxing coach was a Christian, and every workout came with a Bible lesson. One day, Juan took a blow to the head. I told my dad my leg felt funny. I blacked out at that point. From that on, I don't remember. Juan suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a brain bleed, and was rushed to a hospital where he underwent emergency surgery. The doctors told his parents he may never wake up. And if he did, he had only a 30% chance of living a normal life. He said, I'm gonna give your son 12 hours. After 12 hours, I'm gonna give him three days. After three days, we're gonna to have to see what you want us to do. I couldn't comprehend it, I couldn't think. I was in, kind of in shock myself. When he told us that, my wife looked at me and she goes, you need to pray. So that's when I went into the, to the extended waiting room and I just cried out to the Lord. Johnny and his wife Helen stayed at their son's bedside, praying through the night. So right now we're not going by what the doctors tell us, we're going by what God says. I started playing nothing but worship music inside his room during the nighttime. The very next morning, Juan woke up. At that time, it was like God was just assuring us that everything was gonna be okay. After the first week, I seen the turnaround, and on the sixth day, he started telling me he wanted to walk, and I seen, that's when I knew that everything was gonna be okay. I knew that God's hand was in it. The path back for Juan wasn't easy. We had to teach him how to eat again, and we had to teach him how to drink again. We had to teach him how to use a straw, how to read, how to spell his name. But I knew that God's hand was in it because it just happened. He, he did so good. Juan regained most of his brain function within a matter of weeks. But instead of being grateful to be alive, he was angry. That day they told me I can't box. I can't play baseball. And when it got real to me, I hated God because I felt like he took everything away from me. As Juan's body continued to heal, his father prayed that God would heal his heart as well. One evening, he talked Juan into going to hear an evangelist at a youth camp service. I was just praying, Lord, please speak to my son because he's not listening to me anymore. I had my eyes closed and I was still praying. And when I seen him get up, I got up and followed him. And so they prayed for him and it was like the Lord just took over. I was so mad at God and all he was trying to do was give me a hug. That's when I gave up. I was like, I'm done fighting. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna win. I couldn't move. I, I felt paralyzed. They prayed for me, and then all of a sudden, I felt peace. 
I really feel like I had a spirit of anger in me. That night, I felt like it came out. And that's when I knew God loved me. Juan surrendered his life to Christ that night. You ever fish for bass? They fight, they fight, they fight, but your job is to keep them on the line. Let them fight till they get tired. Like God let me fight, he let me hate on him, but I always stayed on his line. And now I feel like he reeled me in. The accident, I don't see it as taking stuff away anymore because it gave me an opportunity to touch more lives than I could ever do. Today, Juan has returned to both the boxing ring and the baseball field. But most importantly, he sees God in a brand new light. I don't see God as a judging God. I see God as a merciful, loving God. I see him as a father who wants his kids to be safe. He doesn't walk away from us. We walk away from him, and he's, he's waiting there. God loves you, and he's just waiting for you to come back home. Oh, what a great word. He loves you, and he's waiting for you to come back home. God is a loving father. Look, he controls everything. This, this universe is huge. The planet we live on, this earth, is just a tiny little fly speck in the middle of all the uh, heavens and the earth. And our God created the heavens and the earth and everything that dwells therein. But he made human beings in his own image, and he put them here on this little planet. And he says, okay, guys, now you work it out, and, and I'm going to be with you, uh, but I want you to find me and to love me and to get strong in me, and then I'm going to have a whole new heaven and earth, and there it's going to be wonderful forever and ever and ever, world without end. So I thank God that men like Juan what a beautiful young man. What a beautiful countenance. You look at his countenance, you say, this guy, this kid has really got something. He's tremendously appealing. Do you want that? Now's the time. Stop fighting God. He loves you. And he's got something really wonderful for you. Yeah, there's trouble in the world, big trouble. But God's in charge of it all. He can take care of everything for those who love him. So if you want him right now, just pray with me right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, I come to you, and I confess anger. I confess sin. I confess evil. I confess things that I've done. And I ask you to forgive me. And Lord, right now, come into my heart. Live your life in me, and I will live for you, and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I want to give you something to help you. You don't have to get it if you don't want to. But I would like you to call up and say, look, I prayed with Pat. I just gave my heart to the Lord. Somebody's on the telephone who loves you. And just call. And if you want, I'll give you this. It's got a CD in it and a little booklet. Tell you what's next. 73 minutes of concentrated explanation of what you've just done. I'll give this to you free. The number is easy to remember. It's 707,000, 800 707,000. And you can call and say, look, I pray with that guy on TV. I've given my heart to the Lord, and I have peace with God Almighty. Terry? Well, still ahead, he's the best-selling novelist, and his books have been picked up by Hollywood. Charles Martin takes us inside his latest page turner when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The Supreme Court of Pakistan will hear the final appeal tomorrow of a Christian woman who has been sentenced to death. Asiya Bibi was arrested in 2009 after an argument with her Muslim co-workers who refused to drink from the same water bowl with her. They claimed it was contaminated because she's a Christian. When Bibi defended her faith, the workers accused her of insulting the Islamic prophet Muhammad. She was arrested and charged with blasphemy and sentenced to death by a judge. Since then, attorneys and human rights activists have been working to appeal her case. 
The Virginia Department of Veterans Services is under fire for allegedly mishandling records. The state attorney general is launching a criminal investigation after authorities found dozens of boxes containing sensitive patient information in a former employee's storage unit. The boxes contain several years' worth of claims and medical records of hundreds of veterans. The VA's failure to serve veterans in a timely manner has been an ongoing problem. This past June, authorities discovered that more than 24,000 veterans were misdiagnosed due to poor management. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Well, we're in the home stretch of our 40-day campaign to pray for our nation. Our final day is this Friday. If you haven't signed up yet, please do. Over 100,000 people have done so. You can log on to PrayForAmerica.com or you can call us at 1-800-700-7000. We also have another way to show your support. It's these prayer lapel pins. You can get one for a gift of $10. If you want more, you'd like to give away to your family and friends. It's just $5 extra for each of them. So call us 1-800-700-7000 or log on to PrayForAmerica.com. Charles Martin was selling insurance and writing a book on the side, and then one day his insurance company offered him a six-figure income and a six-figure bonus. Sure, he needed the money, but Charles turned it down, and it's a good thing he did. Charles Martin has been writing since he was 15. He published his first book in 2004, but that came only after Charles graduated from Regent University. The Lord gave me the pen to sort of express whatever was bubbling up inside me. I was able to get on a page, but I couldn't get out my mouth. Now he's the New York Times best-selling author of 12 novels. His latest, Long Way Gone, is the story of a wayward son. Well, Charles Martin is joining us now, and we welcome you back to the 700 Club, Charles. Thank you. I just mentioned, you know, you were offered a six-figure income, a six-figure bonus, you turned it down. What was, we just want to know what was going through your mind at well, that was, moment. I don't know. I, I think the Lord gave me faith in that moment. But more yeah. importantly than that, I think he gave Christy faith for us. Because she yeah. really, my wife gave me permission to like wow. try this gig. There was a moment in our house where she said, and we're trying to figure all this out. She said, okay, we're going to do this one time all out. Because yeah. I don't want to get with you to your age 40. Yeah. And you tell me you could have been somebody else. Boy, that's the truth. I want to say also that along the way, because I think this would be helpful to people to know, it wasn't like you stopped the insurance company and voila, you had a writing career. No. 86 rejection yeah. letters. I read somewhere that uh, if, if F. Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise was rejected 126 times. So Ooh. I took a little yellow sticky note. And put it right there on my turn on my computer <laughs> terminal. It said 126, and I said, when I get there, I'll quit and go do something else. Yeah. And I probably had no intention of doing that, but it was a marker. Yeah. And when we got to 85, I, that was not a good day. 86 was not, but shortly thereafter, I got an yeah. agent. What, and you know, that's the way it happens, isn't it? Like rejection, 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 and then the moment. What was the turning point? My grandparents had lunch at the National Prayer Breakfast and sat next to an author, and he invited really? me to lunch. Strategically positioned. Yeah. I mean, the Lord. Did. I didn't do this. The Lord did it. Wow, uh -huh. amazing. Well, you've published twelve novels. We mentioned he yeah. was sitting here with me, saying, "I still can't believe I've done this." No, I can't. <laughs> I mean, Harper Lee wrote two, and she's really something, you know. And I think twelve. <laughs> Christy and I, the other morning at breakfast, when the book came out, we we're sitting at the table praying, and I'm like, "Lord, thank you for twelve. And it was the first time I had voiced twelve. Twelve. And I yeah. just. I couldn't How believe it. How did that happen? Well, the latest, Long Way Gone, is just releasing. What, what was your inspiration A couple for years this ago, one? I was speaking somewhere in North Georgia, and after I finished, a lady came up to me, and she told me the story. Her son's in prison. He'll mm -hmm. be there for a long time. He did a lot of bad things. She's heartbroken. There's a lot of pain looking at me. And she looked at me with this kind of desperation, and she said, when is gone too far gone? Wow. And that just it kind of pierced me. A couple weeks later... I'm in Luke in the 15th chapter, and I, I mean, you, you read about the prodigal and what he does and how far he goes, and, but then you get to the 20th verse, and it's one of my favorite, and it says, but while he was still a long way off, 
And it means no matter where you go, no matter how far, no matter what you yeah. do, no matter what shame, sin, whatever, that the love of the Father finds you. I mean, Isaiah says, my arm is not so short that it cannot save. Yes. So yes. with that picture in mind and with some letters I got from some guys in prison asking the same thing, I said, I wonder if I could tell the story my, my way. way. Yeah. So that yeah. novel maybe is my answer to that question. Well, the main author or the main character in your book is an aspiring musician. Yeah. Boy, you could relate to that as an aspiring writer. Our real son yeah. John T is our is our musician. And I had I went to Nashville and did some great research. I met one of Zach Brown's backup singers. I met Taylor Swift's acoustic guy. I met some phenomenal folks. But when I brought it home, John T, who's now 16, kind of helped me unpack it, and he helped translate it from music to English. Yeah. So it was the Christy and I looked at it and it was like 13 <laughs> years of piano lessons finally paid off. <laughs> Here it is, novel number 12, right? Well, it's, it's a wonderful read. And I want to mention also that one of your other books, what was it called? Uh, the Mountain Before the, Us? The Mountain Between Us. The Mountain Between Us is now being made right. into a movie. Talk right. about 20th that. 20th Century Fox has had it for several years, but they're kind of in the final stretch. So we're told the executive producer is the lady that did The Life of Pi. Um, wow. They've signed up Idris Elba and um, a little unknown actor by the name of Kate Winslet, Woo. <laughs> or actress. I'm sick. I'm excited. For, I think I, I hope they make a great movie. I mean, I do. I hope they pull it off and we can take our kids and go see it. And yes, they Wouldn't start filming uh, December first in yeah. Vancouver. You know, one of the things I've noticed about you, Charles, is no matter how many books you write, no matter how successful you are the core of who you are is your faith. Mm. You're a graduate of Regent yeah. University, and yeah. what role did that play in strengthening? We were on Facebook Live a minute ago. I'd never done that. That was my first time, and <laughs> she asked me to pray at the end of it, and I said, I, I'm good at that. I've prayed a lot on this campus. This is what got me out of here. But the, when, I got, <laughs> when I got here, my, I'm seriously in that chapel. My buddy and I, Kurt, would go in there and just kneel down before class, but it was my heart then and now was like, Lord, this is my gift. This is what I do. This is what makes me, it's like breathing. Yeah. I love it. So let yeah. me go do it. And I hope, I love that my, that says, you know, one of my books has hit the New York Times list. But more importantly than that, when I get letters from guys in prison, yeah. and it's these muscled, tattooed men that are going to be there in life, and they tell me that my books reach them in places that nothing has reached them in a long time. Yeah. I'd rather have that. Amen. So I'm still offering my gift to, for the, you know, to the king and saying, mm -hmm. here it is and use me. And I, I pray that he does. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, he has, he is, and I'm sure he will continue to because your heart's in the right place. It's a wonderful book. Charles, thank you for being with us and Thanks sharing your back. story. It's so inspiring. Listen, if you are looking for a great read, check out his latest novel. It's called Long Way Gone, and it's available nationwide. And then watch for that movie because it sound like, sounds like it's going to be wonderful and something fun. If you're looking for a great place to continue your education, you might want to check out Regent University. You could be one of those people on your knees in the chapel. <laughs> Call the number you see on your screen, or you can log on to regent.edu for more information. Well, coming up later, time to bring it on. We've got questions from you. Charmaine says, my son is required to write a report on homosexual couples and long-term relationships for his college art class. What can be done to protect his rights? We're gonna weigh in on that more, so don't go away. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Well, it's time to bring it on with the email questions that you all have sent in. And Pat, this first one comes from Charmaine who says, my son is a 24-year-old Christian. He just told me that his college art class was shown pictures of gay couples in long-term relationships. My son has to write a report on this. He's shocked, and all he could say is, what? I was wondering if he could do something to protect his rights. He shouldn't have to go to school and have to watch that. What do you think his course of action should be? That's tough. You know, in the old days, you'd say immediately go to court and say that his rights were being taken away from him. Unfortunately, yeah. the court has now said that homosexual rights are a constitutionally protected uh, area. Uh, so what's he going to do? Uh, I, I'm afraid that, that what he's going to have to do, he could uh, write a report saying that this wasn't art and, and expressing the fact that uh, why it wasn't good. 
And I think that would be the way to go. But he's in a bind. I mean, we're looking in, in, in a culture that is just going to pot. And uh, it has given itself over to bizarre types of sexuality. And uh, it isn't that people didn't practice these things throughout history. It's just that they, they didn't get constitutional sanction. I mean, 100 years ago, this would have been unthinkable. So what does your son do? I, I really don't think that a, uh, he could win in a law case. Uh, he could drop out of the art class, but he wants to be a, an artist, and that's what they're imposing upon him. I, I really, you asked me, what would I do? I think that's the best way to do it is to see those pictures and criticize why they aren't any good, why they're not good art. And if he's good enough at it, he might get a good grade. Yeah. But, you know, he might not be getting an art degree because if you're at a, a liberal arts college, yeah. you have to take an art class anyway. So, I mean, well, you know, uh, find it, another. But you're <laughs> exposed to these things. Look, look yeah. at that. That Maplethorpe, I mean, all that awful stuff, and they were putting it in, yeah. in, in museums and taxpayer money. I mean, it was just terrible, mm -hmm. but that's the way they were doing it. Yeah. All right. This is Michelle who says, I feel Jesus in my heart. I know he watches over me. I feel his love, but I still sin, even though I don't want to. Am I still a slave to sin? Well, the Bible says, he that is born of God does not continuously sin. Of course you will sin. Of course, you will have temptation. Of course, you will fall with that. Uh, you know, John Wesley said, doesn't a day go by that I don't plead the blood of Christ? We need the blood of Christ. And uh, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ continuously cleanses us from all sin. So you are not going to be free from sin until the day you die and you become uh, transported into a new world. So we are in the flesh, and the flesh is always warring against us. And what we need to do is to put to death the deeds of the flesh, and that we might live for the Lord. And that's the process of mm -hmm. sanctification. So as you walk down the line, it will get closer and closer to Jesus. That's their goal. Is that all? Yeah. I guess. I think that's all the time that's we all have we got. for now. Well, folks, thank you so much for being with us. I hope I didn't uh, give you a downer today. <laughs> I was just, you know, we've got to face the world that's yeah. there. Well, I, you know, I think maybe the question to be asked is, how should we then live in I, the I midst think, of this? Well, you know? we're going to win. I, I want to say that in this, I'm an eternal optimist. We, in, in Jesus Christ, we win. Well, we leave you today with a power minute from Jeremiah. Here's the winner. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Well, we've got a stand-up football player tomorrow on the show, and so you don't want to see that. Charles Johnson. Okay. And so for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And we will see you tomorrow with another exciting edition of the 700 Club. Bye-bye.